Good morning, everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome at to today's webinar about artificial intelligence and supply chain. We will talk about whether artificial intelligence will be the supply chain planner of the future. I'm Eileen. I am a learning and development advisor here at Antwerp Management School. And generally, I help or I advise people uh, or working professionals, rather, who are looking for a further education and help them make the right choice um, when looking at different programs. But today, I will not be doing <laughs> that. I will be moderating today's webinar. I will keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so before we start, some practical information about that. Uh, the webinar will last for one hour. So from 11 to 12, and it will also be recorded. So this recording and the slides you will receive afterwards in an after mail that you will receive somewhere next week. Now, once we officially start, feel free to drop any question that you might have about the information or the content that the speaker, Tom, will share today. Drop it in the chat because we will come back to those questions at the end of the webinar. Just make sure that if you address your question or you, you pop it in the chat, that you address it to everyone. Otherwise, we will be the only ones seeing your question and your question might spark someone else's interest. So address it to everyone. Um, so that's it already from my side. I uh, just would like to introduce uh, the speaker of today. And that's, as I said, that's Professor Tom van Wunsel. He is an expert in operations and supply chain management, both here at uh, Antwerp Management School, but also at um, Eindhoven University of Technology. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elim. So I, I guess everybody hears me uh, reasonably good. I'm in a big room, so there might be a little bit of echo on top of that. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm a very warm welcome and good morning from, from my side as well. Um, and coming uh, 45 to an hour, I, minutes, I would like to um, yeah, somehow introduce you a little bit to, uh, to, to a, a, a search or a sort of a journey we have been, uh, we started a few years ago into uh, what is the role of AI, artificial intelligence, can AI somehow do something into transforming your supply chain and, and transforming maybe the need for other people and so on and so on. And so that was actually inspired by a question we had a few, um, probably three, four years ago when we when we were talking to a few companies um, they, they, they were basically asking, can we get rid of the planner now? Because AI is there and this AI thingy um, um, has at least, they promise that it has the opportunity or the possibility to, to, to get rid of some people. And, and, and I think that triggered for me quite a lot of questions because I did not really know what the answer was at that moment in time. And I probably, I still don't know the answer, but I might be getting a few steps further now down the line into getting to an answer. Uh, but at least it initiated a, a big a big type of work where we actually, where we are working together with uh, a big group of people. So we have in this moment in time, there are around uh, 12 PhD students, so researchers actively working into um, uh, the AI planner of the future, if you want. Eh? So in the sense that what, what would this mean if we would be going into an AI planner? And then, of course, there are many aspects in there, and we will be touching upon a few of them today as well, because it goes from, let's say, the pure operations, supply chain, different type of aspects, but it also goes into ethics, into believing what the AI plan, whatever that means, is saying. So there, are, uh, it goes into digital twinning, it goes into a variety of different type of topics, and and obviously, I only have 45 minutes uh, in a sort of a in a sort of ascending type of mode. So I, I probably do not have, I cannot um, yeah, discuss everything what these 12 PhDs are doing um, um, on this type of topic, AI planner of the future. On the other hand, of course, it is also important that it is, it is a research-based type of uh, storyline. 
But on the other hand, it is clear that it is not only um, uh, a sort of a nice office desk re uh, research work, but it is based on on quite a long and a heavy collaboration with uh, with many companies. So we are actually working together with around 20, 20 different companies. And these companies are going from, let's say, more into the high tech, which is then companies like uh, ASML. But we also go into service providers, um, into retailers. And so we try to somehow um, work together with these companies, trying to understand um, yeah, what type of processes could we actually look into and try to get into this next step of AI supply chain planner of the future, whatever that means. So that is a bit, let's say, a bit uh, quite broadly setting the scene where I'm coming from and also somehow uh, indicating into what type of uh, work this is grounded. Now, it is clear, and that's uh, maybe a disclaimer up front, is that um it is only scratching the surface at this moment in time so we are at the moment looking into um this work we try to understand we have a lot of uh, phd researchers we also have a lot of um, master thesis projects going around these type of topics and what you see is that both from a uh, let's say from a machinery point of view a methodological point of view into um then we typically start talking about um, machine learning type of approaches and or analytics type of things. Also there you see that we are yeah, moving into a better understanding, but also into the more application side, uh, what type of processes can we upgrade, can we optimize using this more advanced machinery uh, that in both cases you see that we are trying to understand does it make sense does it where does it make sense and uh, what is then needed in order to get there huh? because it could be that we identify hey these are interesting uh, things to do but then of course that doesn't mean that in a in a in a snapshot or in a, in a sort of a very fast mode it is immediately um, uh, transformed into an ai enabled whatever process so this is uh, the background. Just to, um, let me just see that it uh, my slides are moving forward. Yes. So that that's uh, Aline already mentioned that. I think she um, uh, she explained more or less everything I'm doing. So I'm I'm a more or less in an operations management, supply chain management type of um, research mode. So I do most of my work is in uh, the supply chain operations. It is also mostly related, quite uh, technical in the sense that. Um, um, if you look at most of the work we we are doing, I'm doing with also with these with around 20, 25 PhD students, uh, it's quite technical, mathematical, quantitative oriented. So we are looking into algorithmic building, into working towards um, um, uh, tangible solutions, so that we actually are somehow improving decision making in a company setting. And of course, we do that together with uh, with with many companies, as I already said. And that's uh, this European Supply Chain Forum um, is for me an enabler because there are 70 companies, 75 companies actively working with us on a variety of topics, going from uh, business to consumer to servitization to high tech to um, data and so on, and so on. But that is actually for me a sort of a laboratory in which I can work together with many companies and somehow translate, uh, validate the ideas, uh, the research ideas we are working on. If you're interested, just take a look at my website or get back to me and I will be happy to share more details and information about many other things if you're interested in that. So let's go uh, into AI supply chain planner of the future and try to identify um, um, uh, trying to get into an understanding what does that mean where should we go into and um, and 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 at the end I would like to somehow um, give a sort of an extremely high level um, overview or or framework uh, of where we are basically uh, talking into now um, so let me just see I need to clean up blocks I think if I do this and if I do this then my full screen should be available but then I don't see the the chat anymore but that's um fine so let's move forward and um so um 
a key question is in these kind of things is what is AI? And I think that is, of course, um, an important one to identify AI. And of course, we can um, we 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 can go into the standard definitions, and we still look into um, um, Oxford Dictionary, and um, they 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 basically say something like it is a computer that has a certain intelligence, and um, uh, and typically it is a sort of a human intelligence, which is somehow. Um, 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 uh, replicated by via computer systems and doing these kind of tasks such as and then there are visual perception speech recognition i think everybody uh, knows about these kind of things if you are now using teams you can even ask for a transcript and the transcript is uh, is quite quite good and so it somehow tries to understand what you say and it puts it puts that in a transcript you see decision-making type of things popping up. Um, so there are many re things which are quite uh, quite interesting. And if you would look uh, a few years back, there, uh, there are a few books which actually at the time were, were somehow explaining AI and then they were talking about many of these kind of um, concepts like uh, learning and uh, machine learning type of things. And then you typically have these type of examples like uh, chess, or go or you use reinforcement learning type of um, uh, algorithms to to somehow make um, good decisions um, or a sequence of decisions if you talk about chess or go or even atari games eh, where you say hey well, let's use and train the computer so that they can actually do these tasks in a very good fashion now the funny thing is that in these type of um, in these games they were playing you of course see that um, the 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 environment in which these games are playing is relatively um, clean. It's relatively closed. It's a relatively uh, certain environment. Meaning, you know, uh, when you win the game with chess or with go, you also know what type of moves you can take. You know what uh, what is happening if something is uh, if you take a certain move, you can reasonably well forecast what the other one will do, and so on, so on. So there are many kind of um, uh, let's say quite controlled type of environments, and then you see that. Machines are quite good at these kind of things. Now, of course, if you take a supply chain setting, that might not be necessarily the case because there's quite a lot of uncertainty, stochasticity. There are many things that the machine is seeing for the first time. So how do you take that into account? And uh, is that really going to make sense to, to, to do some of these type of activities? Yeah, so you see already a little bit like ah, there might be a sort of a, uh, a balance between some activities could be done with the machine because the machine is going to be very good at this and some other activities are maybe probably too difficult or not uh, or uh, first time this happens then the question is is the machine going to be able to do something with that because if you look at the, the lower part of the of uh, of the of the of the figure is that again a uh, simulation of human intelligence processes by machines and then you see a number of type of actions which we typically would like them to see in in this uh, human intelligence kind of things in the machine doing something and then you see that uh, it goes from learning uh, you need to understand you need to observe things and and um, in in a more traditional setting collect data and of course data is one thing but in order to do something with data you need to learn and then it becomes information this is of course a typical statistical type of exercise where we use uh, quite a lot of um, 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 learnings which are basically multivariate data anal analysis based and so on so and of course reasoning you need to be able to somehow come up with the right algorithm to go to a certain outcome so you need to be able to understand what is needed to actually get to this desired outcome now of course that is not always clear uh, in chess it is i want to make sure that i win the game um, in a supply chain setting you also have to think about yeah what what does that mean and the kpis are also sometimes diverse and conflicting with each other and so on so self-correction is of course that of course you should be able to somehow learn all the time and to somehow get into understanding that maybe the world changed and as a consequence i need to do something differently and then you might need to adapt algorithms and adapting algorithms 
could be done either via maybe parameters in the algorithm, but it could also be somehow even change the algorithm as a whole. And then, of course, you end up in this creativity kind of things where you somehow say um, you might be actually using the machine so that they actually can develop new things. And there are many examples now already, and I will get back to that in a second as well. So you see that these definitions are, and if you look at any of these definitions, you take any textbook, you look on the internet, and uh, you take a uh, tech target, you take any, if you go to uh, Gartner, I will show you some of them. They will all say something similar is that there is a computer system that should somehow be able to intelligently make decisions and intelligently is then somehow referred to as um, how humans make decisions should be somehow transformed into a computer system discussion. And of course, um, it is the, a nice starting point, and that's a, a nice definition. Now, of course, if you take the, um, the, 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 the Gartner hype cycles and these kind of things, then um, there is this cycle on um, um, artificial intelligence and the use of uh, AI. And then you see, of course, that um, you see somewhere in the innovation trigger, artificial general intelligence. So it basically refers to something like, hey, uh, a machine that is basically able to do everything. Yeah, the question is, that still seems to be quite far away. And then you see quite a lot of different elements which are both on the technology side, but also somehow sometimes on the application side, on the even social sciences side in terms of ethics. AI maker teaching kids, so that is more into the education part. And then, of course, you see a number of obvious things, which we are probably using quite a lot already now. Uh, think about intelligent applications. I already mentioned Teams, uh, vision, computer vision, AI cloud services. So you see that we are getting more and more into a number of these kind of elements but really into decision intelligence, as you see in the innovation trigger, you see that it is still in the upward part and that we expect that somehow the coming two to five years, maybe a bit shorter, maybe a bit longer, is, uh, is coming up probably uh, quite soon. Now, uh, this is a cycle from 2022, huh? so you have to be aware this is before the chat GPT things and so on and so on. So the, this is based on the information of 2022. What you typically see in this type of environments, things are flowing extremely fast. So it's not always clear upfront um, um, whether these, these, these data are still valid now. So it would be very interesting to see the next one and then uh, basically understand more of that. So I probably expect this to be around the summer. Now you see similar things. Um, in terms of supply chain strategy, now, of course, uh, and emerging tech, uh, you see very similar things popping up. Again, in emerging techs, you see a number of things which are AI related. The, the metaverse, uh, you can somehow use a sort of a digital environment, simulation type of environment in which you actively participate and that you can learn in a different way. And, and participate in a different way with each other. And that could be digital meetings into learning in an operating theater and going back in time to, to, to be part of history or whatever. So you see that this is of course also related to, to some of these AI things. Uh, digital humans, which is related to these cobots and, and extending yourself and adding uh, extra things to you. And then um, you see also, if you look at the, the right side of the figure in a supply chain strategy setting, you also see kind of similar words popping up. On the other hand, you see there that um, AI is just labeled as AI. And there might be a few things which are a little bit related to uh, to these AI observations as uh, supply chain as a service, maybe some cybersecurity, modular operating models, all these kind of things uh, are possibly related to um, or could be enabled to do that better with some AI things. But then interestingly, if you look at the supply chain strategy uh, hype cycle for, and if you look at uh, artificial intelligence, which is um, in the upward part into innovation trigger, it still says that this seems to be getting more and more relevant in 10 years from now. So you see that they are not always aligning with each other. And that, of course, the question is, why is this more than 10 years? Because probably at least the idea is that the technology might be there, but how does that translate into a supply chain setting that that still seems to be an open, open question? 
which is a which is a good because it, it opens up the door for these discussions as today, but also with the research and these kind of things. Now, important thing there is that I think more or less uh, at this moment in time, um, although we talk about as if it is something which is far away, in, in essence, we are using AI already quite a lot. Eh? So we are using lots of kind of um, um, uh, small technologies, if you want, or small or large technologies, which is actually somehow um, um, uh, helping you in daily in daily life to move forward to do things together with the machine. Uh, so this face recognition type of things into um, uh, with 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 all different type of phones. Um, if you take that one step further, you can add the the image search. You also have on Google the idea that you can talk to your car. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, I think, a Mercedes um, dashboard. You can call, hey, Mercedes, and then you can talk to your Mercedes doing everything. And he recognizes whatever you're saying to him uh, or to the car. The outlook, whatever uh, these days, I, most of the outlooks, the updated ones, are now giving answer suggestions. So it basically analyzes your email, and it basically gives you an information like, ah, but these are three possible answers you could give to this email because I, I basically analyzed that email and I'm and I'm and I think this should be these are reasonable answers. The car navigation and the old car navigation was of course you go from A to B and um, and it would not take into account um, maybe traffic information. It would not give you um, a quite up to date expected time of arrival. So somehow compiling all that information and somehow doing something with that is of course uh, also enabled because of all these different type of concepts we are doing so it is it might be far but on the other end it is not that far if you look at chat gpt a few months ago it was a uh, it was hyping a lot also in education at universities and all other uh, let's say education institutes there was a big um, concern about what are we going to do because chat gpt is there should we then uh, is our students allowed to make use of that because it would somehow um, enable automatic essay writing it would uh, enable uh, easy answers they they pass the bar exam in the us so what are we going to do with that so of course this kind of it's a reality it's there already and it will probably not stop but it might mean that even in an education setting, you also see that we probably need to do things differently than we have been doing them before. So in that sense, um, this kind of AI is there. And of course, it, it somehow enables you to do things differently. Uh, in many of these elements, you see that uh, we are automating things. We are somehow enabling things to, uh, to do differently and that you automatically make a number of decisions or we give away some activities, processes to somebody, to a machine, and that we don't need to think about these kind of things ourselves anymore because we can think about certain things, but we cannot consider everything. So in that sense, it, we, it, uh, it, this kind of automation type of things and moving into a different reality that... Um, that is that has always been there and that's quite funny if you start looking from that from a historical perspective then uh, the question is should we be afraid of this ai should we be afraid of this automation type of things and then um yeah i i, I was just scouting a number of things in uh, uh, over the past weeks do you understand hey um how does this changing uh, new technology popping up automation what is the consequence of these kind of things and then it's interesting to see that we were, we are afraid, or we think this will take something, uh, this will mess up our lives like crazy. And we have been thinking this already for decades that this is the case. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a of an overview, this is something from um, early, um, um, uh, I think the 1900s somewhere. That at the end of the ride. They say, hey, we are going to be the new slaves of machines because this was new machines were popping up and um, and the role of machines will be um, will lead to unemployment. So because of uh, the machine, we will not be able to work anymore. The uh, the marriage of the machine makes idle hands. So you see there 
that there were somehow prognoses into the future. We will grow in population, but unemployment will go down because we will be producing more and more. I think this is a picture from early uh, 1930s. Does machine displace men in the long run? So if the, uh, you see, okay, it's a robot here. Put in AI, you have exactly the same discussion sometimes you see popping up. So we are losing potentially something because of automation. Um, 1955, hey, we are going to look into automation. Should we do that? What is the consequence of automation? Are we going to, um, let's say, are people not going to be able to write anymore because of the machine or the computer? And uh, are we going to do something about that? Because it actually leads to unemployment. Automa uh, automation leads to less jobs and so on and so on. So you see that over the years, um, we are basically saying something like the type of jobs, the type of people, the type of um, uh, we, the employability of people will lead, uh, will be tempered because of the fact that we actually are setting up computers, we are using robots, we are using automation, and as a consequence, we should be afraid of that and we should not want to do that kind of things. Eh? So replaceable humans, um, can we get rid of people? Like, eh? We will not displace human workers, they are wrong. So at the end of the right, you see that there is a lot of uh, people against the idea of, um, of using this type of um, AI because they think, yeah, we will lose jobs. Now, interestingly, uh, if you go back, this is another example. If you look at, um, it is part of the evolution at the end of the right. So this graph is a graph of uh, cars or, or let's say means of transportation, broadly speaking. And then you see something like over the so many years uh, from 1850 to 2000, you see that we are um, having, of course, in the beginning horses and carriages. And at a certain point, you see that cars are taking over. And of course, the interesting thing is um, horses did not complain at that moment in time. So people are working at companies and they, they see their job is going to be gone because they, they, there is an automation happening. They, of course, are complaining. But here you see that we all think like this kind of transformation from horses to cars actually did make sense. Now, interestingly, if you look at the kind of transformation process that was happening, you see, of course, that at the beginning, um, horses and cars, uh, you see this in the picture on the, the lower right part, they needed to be, uh, they, the horses needed to be, let's say, trained to not be afraid of cars. So they actually were somehow training cars, uh, horses, better said, so that they can uh, nicely live together into the, uh, in the city context or whatever. And there were even people who actually said, let's somehow build a, a car that looks like a, like a horse so that we actually are, so that they will not be frightening um, the, the horses on the road. So it, it, this it probably did not happen, this, this lower left part, but this was somehow trying to understand, can we somehow give them the lift together and probably do not want to give in directly to of losing horses, although there were seen many examples. On the other hand, people were a bit reluctant to, to actually take that into account and move into that one. Another one is a picture, is a small movie, which I will just show you. It's about mobile phones and the use of mobile phones. So uh, in 1999, so just have a look at it. It's only a half a minute. Heeft u een uh, mobiele telefoon? Nee hoor, heb ik niet. Waarom heeft u dat geen? Nou, ik zie er nog niet van in. Wat ben je op aan het fietsen en dan word je gebeld. <laughs> ik heb mijn gewone telefoon, waarvoor moet ik een mobiel hebben. Dat was handig. Maar als ik ergens strand, dan is er ook altijd ergens wel mijn telefoon zelf, een boerderij met een boer met een telefoon. We hebben het jaren zo gedaan en ik vind het wel goed zo. Als mensen mij bereiken willen, dan kunnen ze dat met een brief doen. En uh, is het dringend, dan ben ik telefonisch thuis te bereiken. So 1999, the use of, an, of a mobile phone, should we use that, yes or no? If you now would, uh, if, you, if you would know in 1999 what we would be doing with all these phones and all this technology we have, then people would say uh, 20 years ago, you are crazy. But on the other hand, if you, uh, so it is about the change of mentality, it's about the change of, um, of, of how we are, acting in general. And I think with AI, it's, it's exactly the same. Eh? Mobile phone, there is a many, many, many kind of advantages we have with using the mobile phone over the years, and it, it becomes more and more. 
um, with AI, we probably also at this moment in time might not be fully understanding what is going to be happening in 20 years from now. So if we would be able to make a movie now and we actually do that, okay, and if we would look at this webinar back in 20 years from now, to what extent did it make sense? Maybe we were completely wrong, but this is actually, we should, uh, the point is, let's not be afraid of these kind of changes. Of course, there will be different type of people needed, there will be different type of jobs needed, and there will be different type of profiles needed. The question is, what type of profiles? And obviously, there will be many jobs which will become obsolete because of chat GPT and advanced chat GPTs and whatever other things. Um, but that also opens up the um, uh, opportunity for them to do something else they are, that they can actually evolve into other jobs as well. So that this is a bit like, should we be afraid of AI? I don't think so. We should be actually embracing it and see how we can actually move forward with these kind of things into uh, into into our world, into what we are doing every day. And what I would like to do is a little bit is uh, is now somehow look into how can we use AI in this kind of supply chain context, and 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 of course um, that that means that we somehow need to understand supply chains. Now the good thing about supply chains is that we have been working on that for probably uh, as a as a whole body of work over the past 50 years there is a lot of work happening in supply chain so i think there is quite a lot of knowledge on terms of what we can do now what does that mean into translating some of these kind of things into an ai enabled or an ai planner enabled kind of environment that is actually quite 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 interesting to look into so it goes back to also one of the first slides where I was saying about um, um, this kind of towards creativity or making uh, adaptivity and making these decisions on your own. Um, what I do see in, um, in, in, in most of the companies I work with is that um, in a sense, they, they are driving, they are moving into autonomy. They would like to have autonomous decision making. And they probably call that down the sort of an AI. A part of the definition is indeed autonomously make decisions with a computer system as if it is human intelligence, blah, 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 blah. And um, then um, you want to have autonomous decision making where probably the computer system could somehow say, OK, uh, let's do this. Now, one thing with uh, what I see happening, and that's it's getting better over the past years, is that sometimes in, in order to be able to do autonomous decision making, you also need to actually have the first steps right. Eh? Remember, you need data because this data needs to be collected so that we actually can understand the data. We can transform that data into information so that we can actually do something with that data that we might be even improving upon the processes by optimizing. So you see that from monitoring through control, through optimization, eh? from understanding what is happening in order to be able to control for that so that we can actually maybe manage better into let's do something better and optimize if we have these three steps before autonomy then I see that many companies are, are still struggling uh, with with the early phases into towards autonomy so maybe they are still looking into controlling they are sometimes even in the optimization phase but sometimes com companies they don't know they don't know much meaning they they have data but they don't mine the data. They don't do anything with the data. So in that sense, yeah, there, there, there is even data collection, but not, not really understanding. So the monitoring and somehow translating that data into information and in doing something with that also needs another skill set that people we have, a, we might not have available at this moment in time. So you see that in order to, to actually and take any process in a supply chain setting, go from inventory to manufacturing, to sourcing, to transportation, to warehousing, whatever, if you want to somehow go into more autonomous decision making, you need to have a good understanding about what is happening. And sometimes people talk about these kind of settings as a visibility. We need to see what happens. Now, visibility and being able to add dashboard functions, BI tools, whatever have you, that is much more, of course, connected to this monitoring step. So that's a good first step. But in order to get into autonomous decision making, you also need to somehow be able to control and optimize so that you can immediately see what is the consequence of my actions. Because if I don't understand 
the consequence of actions I take, then also a autonomous machine or a computer system or an AI it needs to have somehow an understanding of, hey, this is something good or this is something bad. So you need to be able to understand what is the consequence of actions. Uh, in, an, in chess, it is quite clear, you win or you lose. In a, in a supply chain setting, it might be that the fill rate is high or low. And the question is then, what is the right fill rate? What is the fill rate definition? So do you see that all these kind of things you need to be able to understand? And then you also need to understand what is the connection between your fill rate and how much inventory you put into the system. So all these kind of things, you need to somehow be able to be in control before you can go to, into autonomy. Now, one example, and that's a framework we are we are we have been working on over the past months, is uh, is to somehow see, hey, we have this autonomous driving type of uh, discussion where we have cars, and at the end of the ride, uh, the 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 ideal picture of a number of people is that they would like to go into level five autonomous driving, meaning completely hands off the wheels, and the car takes all the actions. It it somehow senses and responds to more or less everything. And that, of course, it goes from level five or one extreme end to level zero to the other, to the other extreme end where we do not have any automation. And then you see that in these different levels, which are moving into level five to level zero or level zero to level five, is that you actually are getting more and more into uh, basic help, more and more automatic decision making, steering, braking, and so on. So, so you see that you can also go, uh, and that's where you see that auto autonomous driving is usually going more and more into level three, four, and five, where you somehow are able to get more or less your hands off the wheel or more or less all hands off the wheel, but you still need to be actively participating up to five. You don't do anything anymore. You are a passenger in your own car. So I think this idea, and that's a bit where we are working on, is that you see that the, um, the in this setup and um, you have the driver, what is the driver doing or the planner and the vehicle, uh, which is the, the, the machine or the software or the system, what is the system doing? And that you somehow make this trade-off into you move something more from the driver to the vehicle, you take some activities planning activities from the driver to the vehicle or from the planner to the system and to what extent do you want to go into what level for what type of activity and um, so what I what I will show you highlight you a little bit um, is a, a sort of a translation into how we are we are how we are working with um, with uh, with that type of level zero to level five thinking into uh, planning activities. Now, one thing in there is, and that is something which we which we are which we take into account into um, into our um, into our framework is that um, at the end of the ride. Uh, it is about managing the unknown unknown or managing unknowns in general. And of course, how do you deal with these kind of things, risks, uncertainty, stochasticity? How do you deal with disruptions and so on and so on? And that is, I think, the key question is to what extent can we actually do these kind of things into, um, into this decision-making space in a good way. So if I'm going to talk about forecasting, we have a quite a lot of machinery available that can do that in a good way. But if I'm talking about a ship being blocked in the Suez Canal, the question becomes, can I do something with that in an automatic way, yes or no? So it is about how do I manage this uncertainty? Can I, um, uh, mathematically speaking, model that uncertainty? Can I somehow put that uncertainty into a good setting? If so, what does that mean? And can I then use it as a machine? Can the machine do something with that? Or should it be with a human planner at that moment in time? So it is about, yeah, you see that there are, let's say, problems in the supply chain that might be relatively clean and might be relatively known unknown, where we can actually have a good setup system perspective on but there are probably many things which we might not be able to do that in a proper way and that might need to somehow moving into um yeah uh, either back into a planner or not eh? so that is something i also don't have an answer into 
But I think if you look at this picture, also in a car setting, in a car driving setting, you see something similarly happening. If you're driving on a highway, and it is always uh, 120 because you're at the middle of the night and you're alone, you can put your cruise control on. But if you're driving in a, a city complex in the city of Antwerp at eight in the morning, the question is, is the, is the car going to be uh, let's say independently able to navigate in this type of traffic where there are many bikes and many other cars many pedestrians is this going to be able to manage that uncertainty yes or no and that is i think the key question what you see happening in there as well so what we are uh, what we have been working on and this is the high level perspective uh, so what you see is that we are moving into uh, a similar setting where we have level zero to level five and again, level zero is that more or less the planner is doing everything. The planner is somehow doing everything enabled by software, which might be doing some data manipulations, data collection, data mechanisms. Um, I see that uh, a number of companies, um, transport companies I went to, they have a fantastic planning tool, but they, and there is a plan button, please plan the, the rights for the e-commerce deliveries for tomorrow. And they have a they have this plan automatic button. They never use that button because they the planners are doing more or less everything, and um, the the software is used as sort of a data library. It is somehow to collect the data in a clean and nice way. And then if you see that from the zero level to the higher levels, you see that we intend to move more and more into getting rid of many of the standard planning type of activities and that we are moving into level three and four, where you see that exception handling is going to be much more into the um, let's say into the decision space of the planner and that all the rest is maybe moving more and more into the software because we are using also a different type of machinery in the software where we use where we move a bit more from maybe more data oriented type of things where we do descriptive prescriptive uh, type of analytics into gradually learning learning machine learning type of approaches into reinforcement learning, which is building up policies to make automatic decisions for many, many, many different situations. So at the end, is you see that we are trying to identify to for what extent can we actually move different type of activities much more into a software system. And the question is, and that's an open question, and that might be an interesting question to also potentially discuss it, to what extent do we need to do for everything we do in the supply chain? Do we need to be at level five? Maybe some activities we might be able to, we are happy to be at level two or level three and so on, so on. And this is of course a, a high level picture. There's a lot of stuff below, which we are working on and trying to understand where should we be? And if you would make a picture for inventory control or production management or sourcing, many of these pictures might be different. And if I do that for company one, two, three, four, they will also be very different. So that's why uh, we try to build up this framework so that we can have the discussion with the companies to see where do you want to be, what do you need to do to go there. So um, gradually, uh, what is needed then? So is uh, should we uh, is AI the planner of the future? Is that uh, if that is the question? Obviously. Um, in many activities, AI will be the planner of the future. It will lead to different skills. It will lead to different type of people we need in companies as well, because we need to have people we are able to actually work with this kind of AI machinery, who are able to understand these kind of things. Now, obviously, and I think it is also clear, and that's also clear from quite a lot of experiments we are doing, is that we end up in um doing things better at the end of the ride we increase efficiency in many kind of experiments in many digital twin in many simulations you see that we are maybe we are making more intelligent decisions and as a consequence we actually could increase this efficiency in a, in the type of supply chain cost gains sustainability perspective in terms of uh, greenhouse gases uh, whatever have you um of course, and that goes back to this automation, how far do you want to go? What level do you want to be? Do you want to be level five? Do you want to be level two? What type of process and these kind of things. Now, clearly that, uh, so I think there are quite a lot of gains possible. Uh, of course, what you do see is that uh, there are also um, things which we are still working on and which we need to be aware of. Um, trustworthiness, are you able to trust 
an AI system? Is the AI system, what are the boundaries of an AI system? How far do you go with these kind of things? Interpretation explainability. There is quite a lot of discussion and debate going on that AI seems to be a sort of a black box. We don't understand the decisions that are coming out. So if I don't understand the decisions, why should I use these decisions then? So it's also about explainability and being able to interpret interpretable AI. And the other one, um, for uh, the, but there are many more disadvantages or things we need to we need to be aware of is workforce people availability. It might be uh, I'm I'm somehow um, maybe naively saying yeah these people who are maybe now obsolete can do something else. Of course, people need to be trained to be able to use this kind of different type of machineries, different type of planning tools, and. The number of students that are now studying AI, data, analytics, learning, machine learning stuff, they are quite limited. And there, of course, are going to be many more needed than the ones we are training at this moment in time. It also means the type of people we are training now will be different because many of the things, the tasks will be done automatically. So they need to be able to have probably different skill sets. So there are many kinds of things which are expected to be coming into the future and where we need to somehow do something with, of course, as well. So, and um, going back to the pictures of uh, uh, automation over the years and from 1910 to whatever, and the car example and the mobile phone example, is that and that's also a, um, something which is an impact. We, we also see that although we think we are doing something right now, of course, um, we have to also be aware that we are still doing things within a sort of a framework where we are working in. So if we want to, uh, somehow see what would this person be in the future, but we still take somehow the same perspective as the ones we are using now. Yeah, then it might not be uh, might not be worthwhile uh, and might not be the right path. And and I do see is that um, um, embracing some of these kind of things like ChatGPT and all the, the let's say the ecosystem around ChatGPT or the ecosystem around reinforcement learning things that we actually do not maybe fully understand everything but somehow thinking about not seeing this as a threat but rather seeing this as something like how can we somehow do something more with that um, that actually is probably very worthwhile because these kind of things will not go away on the contrary, they will only become more and more there. So it's a bit like these people thinking, I don't need a mobile phone, so why should we bother? At the end of the ride, there are more mobile phones in the world than people at a certain point. So the question is, uh, should, should we think like, oh, it's going to be away because I don't need it? Or should we actually say, hey, this is now new, interesting technology. Let's make use of that new, interesting technology and take it one step forward with that. The good thing is, I have no idea what it will be. I'm only looking into, again, with maybe my way of thinking into this kind of domain, but I do think there are many, many, many nice opportunities popping up into a supply chain setting so that we can properly make use of AI. And um, I'm, I think, I hope at least I gave you a little bit of an, if, an insight into where we are at this moment in time. I hope it is also clear that we are not far but we are basically making good steps forward into uh, understanding better where we can use integrate AI in supply chain planning um, and uh, in the future. So I would like to end my talk here now, and I would be very happy to uh, answer any questions or discuss anything else, uh, but I will do some stop sharing so that I see a little bit more of you coming back. So. Yes, Tom, thank you so much. And we have two questions in the chat now. And so feel free to address them. We have one from Jort and one from Bert. Um, and anyone else who is still, uh, still listening now, uh, feel free to also pose your questions. We have time for it. And uh, Tom is more than willing to uh, share his uh, thoughts or nuances uh, to your questions. So feel free to share. Yeah. And in the meantime, uh, Tom, Yes, already started so, so, the, so, so the, the question about from your about AI inventory control, inventory management, I think that uh, it's a good one in the sense that um, um, 
And so if you look at the machinery which is being used to do inventory management, inventory control, uh, that's this kind of a uh, policy building. You need to build a policy. Uh, if this is the amount of inventory, do that, depending on uh, the characteristics of your uh, of your inventory setting. Um, you, you see that the machinery which is being used is actually uh, also the same machinery in which is being used in reinforcement learning and these kind of uh, type of um, algorithms. So um, it is a it is a quite clean, straightforward application into inventory. And um, what I do see is that there are quite a lot of applications which take into account richer settings, so more different type of settings where the demand is not independent from each other, where you might want to do promotions, where you want to maybe do um, the sort of a continuous integration between observing demand, putting that into the control rule and something doing something where. So you see that there is quite a lot of interesting work happening um, and uh, enabled mostly by reinforcement learning type of um, algorithms. So there, so there is some nice work there as well. Um, now I need to um, uh, read up a little bit. Uh, solvers for optimizing uh, planning time for things and uh, machine learning. Yeah, the problem with solvers. <laughs> um, so the so one thing for me, let's put it, is that many of these AI machinery we have available at this moment in time. Um, also has the promise in itself to better cope with uncertainty and stochasticity. And so uh, this goes back to this risk and I don't know what is happening in the world and I, I want to somehow manage that type of uh, uncertainty in demand or uncertainty in lead times or whatever. And, and many of these solvers are quite deterministic oriented. So I do hope that in the future that you see that some of these solvers are going to be getting much richer and um, um, unfortunately, this is probably not coming from the bigger companies, but there are quite a lot of small scale-offs that do software as a service that actually are using more and more of these kind of machine learning type of ideas into their uh, software, software as a service. So take, it's probably better to look at some of these kind of um, startup scale of companies that actually try to ex do something more there. At the end, they might be bought by SAP or Cplex or whatever, and then it ends up into their, their machinery at the end of the ride. So um, um, at this moment in time, I don't see much of these kind of things yet happening, with, of course, some exceptions here and there. Um, that uh, bum, 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 bum. Uh, can you please share any forums where we can follow progress in this space? Yeah, that's a good one. I um, uh, uh, I I I will look for it. But I the um, at this moment in time, I don't know of any let's say dedicated single fora where you have everything together. Um, so that's a, a tricky one. I will have a look for that. If I if I know something, I will put it into the uh, notes in the after mail. Uh, uh, in the yep. after mail, so that uh, if there is something similar there, uh, where yep. you could follow up on that. Um, of course, Gartner and the like, and also DHL Trend Radar are always good to see what type of uh, new tech might be popping up, and then how it somehow adapts into a supply chain setting. Not sure about that one. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether how whether SAP. I don't know their let's say their their development agenda. Uh, I, I would expect that at the end of the ride, more or less, many of these type of companies will need to move into a sort of an aut automated decision making type of idea. Uh, the question is whether, let's say, uh, SAP will do that, yes or no. I would expect at a certain point, SAP will probably uh, take over one of the smaller companies and they will integrate this as a package and somehow do something with that. The question is whether SAP is the future. Uh, SAP is also old technology, uh, is very old tech. And um, the question is, does that is that going to be the tech you need to adopt at this moment in time? I have no idea. If you talk to some SAP implementators, they will say, of course, because we have S4 HANA in the cloud now and these kind of things. But that's basically SAP from 50 years ago, somehow into the cloud, sure. Not sure what that means, but but um, I guess um, 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 
these type of companies will be taking over other companies and integrate that into their products. And um, um, so that's going to be um, um, uh, potentially interesting. AI differing in ERP systems inventory. Yeah, um, the, the, I think many of the current inventory management systems out there are, um, are, are, are using more or less standard inventory control rules. And that's based on a very specific kind of um, 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 clear uh, uh, a number of assumptions. Uh, we have a periodic review, which is an R, which is somehow stable. We have a reorder point or whatever, or an order up to level, and we do something. Um, this is not always an optimal policy, but it is a good policy. So the question is if I can do more intelligent things by learning, looking at the data that is popping up uh, regularly, can I then somehow potentially adapt my inventory model itself rather than just changing the parameters of the model? And, and how does that go? And when do you change? And uh, if you see the, that the underlying behavior of the demand in the market is changing, it, does it still make sense to keep the same inventory control or do I need to optimize that and so on and so on? So uh, this is uh, all ideas which are very interesting, but um, um, yeah, I can give you pointers to many of these kind of uh, uh, research domains if you want, um, where, they, where, they, where they're trying to do something with that. There is one last question, maybe uh, Tom from uh, Sebastian that just came in, and then we will uh, finish this yeah. webinar after your answer. So I think it's both at the end of the right, uh, Sebastian. I think it's both is that uh, I think AI lived because of the fact that we have data, that we have this possibility to to mine the data that we have the possibility to make from this data information so that we actually can go into better decision-making, albeit maybe autonomous decision-making. Um, so, so I think it is, um, uh, it is not only a data tool, let's put it like this, but it is data that leads to information, that leads to decisions, and that leads to autonomous decision-making at the end of the ride. So the, because the first three steps data making decisions blah 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 that's something we are doing already for let's say forever you just you collect the data you make decisions and you do something with that that's statistics at the end of the ride so somehow moving into that um, autonomous decision making towards creativity and or auto autonomous learning that the system can automatically update itself all the time that is probably the the bigger ai level type of flavor you put on top of that Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and uh, also thank you, Tom, for answering answering them, uh, uh, but also for your um, valuable insights that you shared before. Um, now, apart from the webinar, uh, should you want to know more about how to optimize your entire supply chain, uh, more in general in all the various domains? Because today we only zoomed in on one specific element. Uh, we will be organizing our three-day supply chain masterclass again in uh, December. And so that will be on campus. But more information about that will also follow in the follow-up email that you will receive next week, along with today's slides. And Tom, if you can think of uh, any fora or uh, resources uh, that you still want to share, uh, we will um, send those along with the email. Uh, but if you want to have a look at this together, uh, the masterclass or any other question that you might have, if you want to have a look at it together with me to see if it could be a good fit for you or an interesting to you, feel free to reach out. Uh, you will have my details in the email as well. So that concludes this uh, webinar. I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and we might still see you at one of our next webinars in the coming weeks. Have a nice day. Thank you.